Kai Hoss, how are you? Hey Tom, how are you? Very good. good to see you. Good to see you. So I'm with my uh, one of my very closest best friends since university, Hoss Armini, Hossein Armini. Um, Hoss was born in the Iranian capital Tehran uh, to a very distinguished Iranian family. Uh, your grandfather was, was the Prime Minister under the Shah in the 1960s, but Hoss has lived in Britain since the age of 11. And of course, he's publicly known as a very successful screenwriter and film director. You were, you were nominated for an Oscar in 1998 for the uh, Best Adapted Screenplay for Wings, Wings of the Dove, the, uh, you know, based on the Henry James novel. And of course, you've done lots of great films. One of my favorites is your adaption, your screenplay rather, for, the, for Drive, the kind of neo-noir film in 2011 with, with Ryan Gosling. And uh, as I said, we're very close uh, friends, and I'm also very happy, of course, to be godfather to your delightful, wonderful son, Ollie. Well, we had that wonderful, we, you know, when we met with Savannah, your beautiful daughter, and they got on really well. So yes. hope for the future. Yes, yes. You're my daughter and your son. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, Hoss, how's the, uh, you know, we're, we're two months into the coronavirus situation, the lockdown, and you're in London. How's it been for you? Well, we've been incredibly lucky with the weather, so it's, that's that's the reason for my tan, um, and and the lockdown is also the reason for my extremely long hair. Um, but it's been it's been normal for me. I, I'm I'm a, I'm a screenwriter, so I'm in work from home. I'm in lockdown most of the time anyway. Um, but we seem to be getting out of it now, which is a relief. So the rest of the world caught up with you, and they've all gone. They've all they're all working from home now. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, Hoss, let's go back, back, uh, back a while. Just um, let, tell me a bit about your family. Um, I already mentioned that your grandfather was was prime minister, but what about your parents? Um, my my parents were my, my dad was a diplomat, and my mother was a TV producer, which was one of the things that first got me interested in in the sort of visual medium, and and and, and they were both very. Um, sort of wonderful, tolerant people. And I think that's what I feel, you know, some of my sadness in Iran is that's been lost, but they brought me up in a way that was very, you know, respectful of other people, other cultures, other countries. Um, and, and I'm very, you know, we're grateful to have learned a great deal from them, really about, about humanity and, and decency. Yes, I mean, I've met, I've met all your family and they're, they're lovely, like as are you. Um, but of course, many people, unfortunately, just have images of Iran through this awful Islamic regime that, that runs it. And they confuse this regime with Persians. Um, and I, I have many Iranian friends. And of course, we were introduced by, uh, by one Shushikapi, a lovely woman who unfortunately passed away. And uh, it's a great pity for Iran. I mean, what, what memories do you have before the age of 11 before the age of 11 of pre-Islamic revolutionary Iran. And have, have you been able to go back since the revolution? No, I've never gone back. And my, my experience was probably, you know, in a, from a very privileged place. My, my, my family were relatively well off. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of the causes for why the revolution happened were, were you know, I wasn't really aware of them. I was too young. But again, like I said, we we're probably watching it all through, you know, dark tinted, car glasses and whatever so it was it was um but 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 i certainly remember that it was a more tolerant society i think that they, they were you know take great pride i mean i still take great pride in iranian filmmakers and some of the culture that comes out of there unfortunately a lot of them get arrested for it but but i i do find you know the lack of tolerance is is, is the thing that, that I find most disturbing and, and, and also the thing that what I remember being brought up that, that you know, there was obviously politically quite a long, lot wrong with the Shah's regime, but, but I, I, I was certainly raised believing, you know, that, you know, every country had a right to exist, that, that, that people, you know, that, that basic freedoms and democracies and things were, you know, unfortunately that wasn't always practiced in Iran, um, but, but, but certainly I, I feel the world has become a much darker place than um, certainly the Middle East has. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think uh, 
saying lack of tolerance is an understatement. I mean, certainly all the Iranians I know are all very hospitable and warm and, as far as I know, tolerant people. But the regime in Iran is one of the worst in the world. Only yesterday, a 13-year-old girl was beheaded. And it was just written. Yes, yes, it's in the papers today. And of course, Evin Prison in Tehran is one of the most brutal prisons in the world. And alongside China and North Korea, it's one of the most brutal regimes. And that's what makes it so sad that it's got this, you know, rich, culturally rich and uh, Persian history. And it's got this rather primitive regime, which. Uh, is causing problems not just for the Iranian population but for many and other there are women as well particularly because I remember I mean there's photographs I've seen going back into the 70s of, and you know that the, you know women um, sunbathing in bikinis and things like that and the idea that not just in Iran but in Afghanistan and Pakistan that there, that there was certainly you know women's rights seem to have gone back back a long way and, sure. and just the rest of the world is, is, is moving very quickly in, in a positive way there. It's, it's, you know, and Iranian women are some of the most brilliant, you know, fantastic, even after the revolution, I think so many of them were allowed to go and study and, you know, and, and, and have really demonstrated how, how, you know, how brilliant they were. And also a lot of the women like my mother's generation who left and were exiled from Iran actually coped with the revolution far better than the men did in the sense that they, they were suddenly free to my mum set up a business and you know actually started making money for herself and and and, and there's I, I have the real pride in what iranian women have and are capable of achieving i think that. and i have to point out it's not just your mother's generation as you know there are today many many protests of people taking off their headscarves and being beaten and so on in iran there's still a lot of brave women and i've worked you know the, the women have been i mean even remember way back in the the group when there was the uprisings sort of about a decade ago the the, the green revolution 2000. well exactly and that awful image of that poor girl who i mean so, so i think that there was you know they're, they're really courageous and 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 um you know again that there is so much about iran that i'm also very proud of um and, and you know unfortunately you know that, that that's not the you know the yeah. perception um, oh, Hoss, let, let's move, we may come back to Iran at the end, but let, let's move to, to your career in the film industry. Mm -hmm. um, I, let's start with, a, with an easy question. Is there someone in particular you've admired, but which people in particular who, who you worked with who, who, who you've admired? Well, I was, I was very fortunate to do um, a rewrite on Gangs New York, which Martin Scorsese was um, directing. And, and apart from you know, one of the things that struck me about him, which was really wonderful, was he made you feel that you were him and he was you. He was I had this extraordinary ability and, and humility to be sort of really interested in what you had to say or bring to the project. And, and, and at the same time, making you feel incredibly good and powerful about yourself. So you felt sort of empowered in a way to do the best work you could. And I remember one example of it was I'd write a scene, I'd take it around to his house and He'd start off by saying how terrific it was, and then very slowly pick it apart. Go well, we could change this and do this, but because he told you, Martin Scorsese told you how wonderful your writing was to start off with, you would do anything for him, and that's what makes him such an extraordinary direction. I think he does that with actors, writers, you know, designers, everyone who works for him. It's incredibly inspiring. Sure, I mean, we all, Scorsese is a legend to, to the whole world. Um, tell me, what about when you're doing um, screenwriting? Um, what's, you know, what's, how do you approach it? What's the, is it, is dialogue more important or structure more important or how do you visualize the script as you're writing it? I mean, do you have different concepts of the finished product as you're going or how does it work best? I mean, I'm, it, the, the, the process for me is one of almost like seeing the film in my head or seeing an imagined film in my head and then trying to transcribe it into words on paper. So. I visualize it a lot and, and when the writing is going well, I really feel in that world. Um, so if, if whether it's a sci-fi thing or a political thing, I, I, the, the more I can see the world where it's taking place in, the, the, the more easily the writing comes. So for example, if a scene's not working, one of the best things they often say is, well, change the weather, imagine it's raining. Or, uh -huh. or, and that, that sort of flips it slightly and anything to be able to, to almost transpose yourself into that world. And that's why research is so important because 
obviously the more research you do, the more of a taste you have for the, the world you're writing about. Um, and I mean, I know you've done all kinds of different um, adaptions from, from, you know, as I mentioned, Drive or the classic kind of films like, I think you did, I remember Jude the Obscure, the Thomas Hardy novel, which was, I think, 1895. So, so it's quite a long, you know, you've written modern and, and older stuff. But let, let me just ask you, you, you um, I remember when we were talking about right at the beginning when before you started your career you originally wanted to be a director as well as a screenwriter but it was only in uh, 2014 that you did your first major directorial film uh, which i enjoyed very much uh, the two faces of january the uh, the patricia highsmith novel and you wrote and directed that um do you regret not having done more directing up to then? I mean, or did you find yourself with a kind of niche in the, that was hard to break in the well, screenwriting? Well, I, I, I do regret it because it was something I loved, I loved doing. And, and, and one of the problems is in the film industry, you, you can very quickly, un, unless you really insist on being a writer-director, um, the, the, the industry sort of separates the two, you know, so well, you either become a writer or a director. Yeah. And, and and it took me a long time and, and then people stopped taking you know they think oh well, script's great but we don't there are lots of other directors we can go to instead of you so i think you have to insist very very early on that that it's your script and you're going to direct it and i wish i'd done that more just just you know sometimes being a bit more forceful about i really i know how to do this please let me do it and i won't let anyone else do it um often that means writing it for yourself on you know and, and not as a commission, because then you don't have control over it. Yeah, and, and also, of course, Hollywood is, is, is notoriously tough industry. I mean, I know you worked for a number of years with Harvey Weinstein, um, you know, some years ago, and he, he, you did quite a few films for him, you wrote screenplays. How, how, was, it, how was it like, he's obviously a, a tough character, how was it, or he seems so from, from what I can see, how, how was it working with Harvey Weinstein? Well, well, I, 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 I can, I can, you know, everyone knows that what's happened, and he's gone to jail for it, or whatever. So I can only really talk about the professional relationship at the time. Uh, he, he was, um, he was very, uh, um, he's very passionate about getting films made in a way that actually you get less and less people like that who would take these mad gambles. I mean, there were certain films, and actually, Gans in New York was one where I think they, as we'll say, they tried to take it around to lots and lots of different, you know, studios and everyone had said no, but, but there was a sort of almost a compulsive gambling, um, I don't care what happens, burn it all attitude that, that Harvey Weinstein had, which meant a lot of films got made. Now, a lot of films also got destroyed because when his expectations were so high of something that if it didn't quite match it, he would, it was almost sometimes like a child with a toy that he was, wasn't happy with his toy and he'd just break it. Um, but but there, there was no doubt that he was certainly one of the most um you know larger than life people i've i've ever been in a room with um and you know any um, any anecdotes about him from your personal no but, but i i'd say one of the things that you know it's very hard because he, i think he was particularly good at, at seeing what everyone's weak points were and pressing those buttons and and you know with some people it was bullying with others it was flattery um, you know, with me, it was often greed. He knew if he paid me, I'd end up doing, you know, writing the script or whatever. But, but, but there was a look. There's a, I mean, I, I have to say, he's certainly associated with some of the best films of my lifetime from, I don't know, Pulp Fiction, you know, Shakespeare in Love, The, the Pianist. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of, he's obviously a tragically flawed figure, but as far as the, as far as his, he has a Midas touch for spotting or developing or producing or promoting or distributing really some brilliant films, uh, as far as I can see. I think he's also, he worked with a lot of brilliant filmmakers. I, th I think that was, that was an, you know, the other thing was, was, you know, to spot a Tarantino as early on as he did. Uh, yeah. and, and, I, and I think, you know, th 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 there was, you know, it's, it's very hard because, because it, it's, you know, obviously, that just that, uh, almost his legacy as a, as, as, as a filmmaker and it has been overtaken overshadowed by by what happened um, I, I and, 
yeah. you know, I, th I think it's, it's um, but there were some wonderful films that, 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 that Miramax and the Weinstein Company produced um, and, and some very bad ones. And, and both of them were partly because Harvey created and destroyed um, with, with the same kind of tenacity, really. Now, Hoss, um, television drama has made a, something of a renaissance in recent years, obviously because of, well, because of TV itself and because of streaming like Netflix. And I know you have done a couple of quite big hits in uh, the last couple of years. There was McMafia um, and for the BBC, and there was The Alienist. Do you, do you prefer working in TV rather than film? Is it, because then you have a chance to develop a script over several episodes or even, you know, what's the difference? What do you prefer? I think what, what's exciting about this sort of, you know, the, the, the way TV has, has become so mainstream now is, is there are certain books, for example, I remember that would have always made better TV shows, but at that time no one wanted to sort of take a great book and turn it into TV. So, so they were almost squeezed into the two hour film format and suffered for it. Um, and, and I think what, what happens now is you, you, you have both. And I think some, some stories, some books um, work better as, as single movies um, because you sort of need to be with that story in a continuous period of time without breaking. And then others, I think, particularly if they deal with long passages of time, um, the, the idea that, you know, you can start from a man's or woman's beginnings to their end, that, that, that sense of time and spending time with them is something that TV does particularly well. Um, and characters become very important because they almost have to be like your friends. If you're going to go back and watch a show again and again, episode after episode, that, that they, that, the, the sort of plot becomes almost less important than character does. Um, what about, um, before we leave the subject of film, is there any other, you know, do you have any particular favourite films or film genres or favourite directors? Could also be historic, it doesn't have to be living ones. Um, or indeed favourite TV shows. And, and I want to ask you two questions. The ones who think are brilliant, almost art, but the ones who just watch for fun as well. It doesn't, they don't have to be great art, they could just be enjoyable series to relax to. I mean, I take my, I, I, I'm one of those people who list their favorite films of all time. And my, my three would probably be Vertigo, Chinatown, and Once Upon a Time in America. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely drawn to, to sort of, you know, the gangsters and um, the violence and murders and, and things like well, that. It's crime a few times over the years, I believe. Right. You discussed The Godfather, even when we went to the... No, The Godfather, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I say that might... They're, no, they're, they're, they're really wonderful. But, but also because they're, they're something sort of... They are art because they're almost like Greek tragedies. And I love those, the, the, the flawed heroes and the, you know, that, the, you know, somehow heroically, tragically, you know, come to an unhappy ending. Um, I'm not a great sucker for happy endings. I tend... I, I, it's actually changed as I've got older, though. I've suddenly now realised that that there is a reason why happy endings work in, in, in all forms of art. And that, that, that idea of um, hope is, is, however cliched it is, I think is very important. Especially in America where films usually are all about money and they want people to leave with a happy smile on their face or a tear or something. People don't really want to pay to go to the movie and leave too sad as a general rule. So, um, yeah, and, and, and there's a reason for that. I, th I think it's, uh, that's what I mean about as I've grown older, I think, and probably more experienced, is, is it's very easy to be, when you're in your 20s, to be, I want to really annoy people. I want an ending that's dark and bleak and I don't care what they think. And then you realise that actually th the most important part of art is to connect with people. So if you're not doing that at every stage, then you're failing. Um, yeah. um, what, if you hadn't been a filmmaker, what do you think you might have, you know, might, what with your career? I mean, as, I, as, as you said, your father was a diplomat for Iran, and your grandfather was the prime minister. Politics, maybe? Well, I think, I think invariably I would have been pushed towards politics because it was, you know, the background I came from, that, that's where you, you, you sort of ended up, whether it was in the foreign office or whatever. I often used to joke with my mum about how I'd be, um, I'd have been a general, a four, you know, four-star general. And I can't, I'm, I can't drive, I'm, I can't tell my left and right apart. So I'd probably been a terrible, terrible, terrible military leader. 
Um, you know, I remember once when we were having a discussion, you told me your, your grandfather had been prime minister in the early 1960s under the Shah. But then he somehow fell out or did something wrong because he was put under house arrest by the Shah. What, what was that about? Well, I think it was, he, he was quite a, a liberal, my grandfather. He'd, 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 he'd been related to the previous dynasty um, that the, the Shah's family had taken over from. And Yeah, so the Qajars, who he, my grandfather was related, related to with the royal family before, and, and he, he, he was quite wealthy, so he was almost he was almost too wealthy to be corruptible, if that makes sense. And, and therefore, you know, th 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 at a time when a lot of people were taking advantage of making a lot of money out of their connections and stuff, he, he was sort of standing up, you know, for, for certain, you know, anti-corruption policies and stuff. Right. And, and after a while, I think he made some enemies and, and, and was removed from power. So they, and they put him in the house arrest. And the house arrest was really, it was, it was a way of keeping him quiet. Um, you know, I, I remember as a child going to his house and thinking, God, my, my grandfather has so many servants and not realizing there were secret servicemen who were kind of standing outside watching the house and making sure people didn't go and visit. I mean, the Shah's regime was a regime. It may not be, have been quite as brutal or made international terrorism like the new government, but it, it wasn't so great. Having said that, I, I think I mentioned to you that uh, a year and a half ago, I had tea with the widow, so, uh, the widow of the former Shah of Iran, the Empress, I, I think her name's Farah, and I mentioned that my, one of my best friends, yourself, was the grandson of uh, Armini, and she, she knew the name and smiled nicely and seemed fine with that. Um, and I've also met you know many Iranians through my work especially at human rights conferences usually these are people who are opponents of the regime and gone into exile or they've been imprisoned and managed to escape and now they live in Paris or Canada or whatever and I often say oh my best friend's Hoss Armenian and they, they, they're aware of the family and I've never heard a bad thing said about your grandfather from any of these anti-regime people in the west so that's uh, well, uh, look, I'm, the thing about Iranians, they, I'm sure there are lots of bad things then because it's just, I mean, there's, there's a very, um, you know, it, it, it's almost like, an, and, and also as a politician, I think it, it, in, in that it's a no-win situation. Um, but it's really lovely to hear, and I know you've been doing lots and lots of, actually, you're, you're, you're one of the most well-read, knowledgeable people about Iran and Iranian politics and history, kind of importantly, that, that you can trace it back to a time before this present regime and, and, and bring that context into, into when you write about Iran. Um, well, so I, all, all my Iranian friends, yourself included, are very, I would say, philo-Semitic towards Jews, okay? And, it's, and I can feel it's genuine. It's not like I hate to say certain people in continental Europe that say certain things, but my instinct is I fear otherwise. I feel a genuine warmth from all, all my Iranian friends. I mean, look, it's often been said that the Persians and the Jews are the two main non-Arabic peoples of the Middle East, and they have much longer, deeper, how can I say, in a way, richer histories than, than the Arab uh, peoples of the Middle East, and, and maybe it bonds them, I don't know. Um, well, I can only talk about, my, I mean, for, for example, when I was, when I was a child, um, my, my closest friend, um, who I think you know, Guy Spear was was so he was he was his, his father, and there was an Israeli embassy or consulate. I can't remember. There was Israelis uh, in, in in Iran before nineteen. Yeah, and and I I you know, and the the other thing was, you know, we were always terrified. I, I, again, I you know, we were always terrified of Iraq invading. That seemed to be when I was a child. That was the big that was the big fear. Well, now, they, they, they did. They did. Um, they did. There was a one million. Yeah. So, so eventually there was, and 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 also again, it's like a bad thing of tolerance, and I don't want to sound too soft about it, but I, I think it is. It's just something that I've always. It's it's really been the most important thing for me. Is is the idea that my idea of Iran was a cultural sort of mix where religions were tolerated and different nationalities, and 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 Iran was such a mix of, you know, the Kurds, the you know, different groupings and and whatever, and and. and yeah, also as someone who came to England and, and was a victim of a degree of racism, and, and I remember very clearly at my, um, 
at my boarding school when I first by other British school children. You mean? Well, I remember coming, for example, to, to when I first came to school in in when I was about twelve. Those of us who didn't go to church, which tends to be the Iranians, um, you know, the Jewish kids and some of the African kids, for some reason, who didn't go to church, were, were we'd all be together at, uh, at the library, you know. And, and I remember a teacher coming in and, and opening the door and going, why aren't you all at church? And then he looks at us and goes, oh, you're all wogs, um, which was a term which was very common when I was... Oh, I like but, but, but you do, and then so not only in Iran did I feel a, a sense of um, just, you know, the, 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 the tolerance there, but then as then coming to England where I felt very much an outsider, you naturally gravitate to people who are also, you know, treated slightly like outsiders they were, and that, that early 80s was, was quite tough like that. Yeah, so we were, we were called names, you know, the Jewish kids were called names, you know, the, 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 the kids who'd come over from Nigeria and whatever were called the worst names. And, and so it's sort of, you, you do think, well, this is, this is so utterly wrong, and why do we live in a world well, where we're treated like that? Um, you think um, Britain has, has, uh, is, has changed dramatically, I mean, it definitely changed somewhat, but is it today, I'm wondering if it's fully tolerant, multicultural London, or if you were 12 years old today, there would be still some of that intolerance. I think, I think it's more tolerant, and, and also to be as, you know, in England's defence, I, I don't think I could have gone as, as a refugee to a more tolerant country in the world. I, th I think that would have existed anywhere I'd gone to, I'm sure it'd been far worse in France or or Italy or Spain, wherever right? I, th I think you know, but I, and I, I do, I do think it's it's hard for me to tell because I'm I'm so based in London as opposed. I, I don't know what it's like, and, and London may be a bubble. And, and again, very multi. I mean, half of London has a parent born abroad or about themselves born abroad. It's very. Yeah. I, I work in a very tolerant industry. I, you know, the film industry is you know um, is very liberal. Um, you know, there's a lot of humanitarian work and I know you do a lot as well but it's it, 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 it's famous I think the film industry for actually being you know involved in a lot of charitable work and, everything yeah. else. and, and so and is very conscious of of equality and you know the fact that I think the Me Too movement is connected to, to you know in a way started with the film industry it is no is no accident um, so I, I sort of feel in a bit of a privileged bubble in that sense um, of, of a world which is probably slightly more um, um, more patient and tolerant than perhaps other industries or other cities or other countries. Yeah. So I think we're probably out of time, but uh, very good to speak to you. And there is something to speak to you and, and, and our really our friendship goes back so long and, and it's, it's, you know, we've traveled together, we've been on holidays together and, and, and you know, been in touch the whole time. Lots so. of memories. We went to San Remi in France. We went to, to Sicily and, and Napoli. And I think that's where you got some advanced ideas for mafia film scripts. And, um, and I think we went to Amsterdam, Paris and other places. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 and it's really like you realise, you know, that those, those, those friendships of a lifetime are just so, so important. And, and anyway, and it's lovely to be interviewed by a friend. Good. Okay. Lovely to speak to you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye, John.